All right, well, welcome to Fridays with Fiscal. Today we are going over USASR reports. I just wanted to start off on the wiki, um, our, my usual starting spot here, because we have a couple of pages uh, with the documentation. We'll probably pop back in here throughout our session today, but I'm just going to open the USASR documentation. And there's two different spots that I usually go in here, the report section has all the information pertaining to your different pages from the menu, report manager, your custom report creator, and then some information on the canned reports. And there's a bit more information in the appendix as well under this report procedures section. So we'll be back in here to look at this one later, uh, but I'm thinking this will probably grow over time as well. So uh, keep in mind there are some helpful walkthroughs um, under the appendix. So let's hop in here. I forgot to get back to my main page. We're jumping ahead. Um, the, what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to look at some of kind of the basics and the general tips on creating reports. We will look at using that report link with um, a FinDet to make a running uh, fund balance. And then I'm going to talk about the job scheduler a bit. And it sounds like someone might not be muted, so if you guys don't mind, just double check and make sure you're muted for me. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go into the report manager first. And I'm, uh, I'll be using the cash summary as our example report today. So if I click to open that report definition, this is going to take us to our um, page where we can modify a template report. This looks similar um, to the page we'd get if we were creating a report from scratch. Um, but I figured we'd modify uh, an existing one so that we have something to work with. Um, now, the first page it's going to take you to is select properties. And this tab is really important because anything that you want to actually see on your report, whether that is a column or a header, you're going to want to make sure that that uh, property is in this grid. So um, this one, we have sort of our standard financial detail, I'm sorry, um, financial summary information, cash summary information. And let me go ahead, I'm going to run this. Uh, just, I'm just going to start generating this so that we can take a look at the standard here. But um, let me hop back and look at the properties while that's creating. When I'm looking at the properties that I want to add to a report, the very first thing that you would have to choose if you're making a report from scratch um, or if I'm just modifying a report, I will always come look at the object that you have up here. And that's important because it's going to determine the primary page that you're pulling your information from. So I'll sort of consider, you know, what's the primary uh, group of information that I want to show, what page is that coming from, and then select my object from there. Um, if you're modifying one, it's still good to know because all of these properties in your list are going to be controlled by what object you're using. Now this one is coming from the cash account, and similar to um, like in Classic, when you would use Safari, you'd have those different tables. And a lot of those tables corresponded to a page in the software. So that is true here as well. Um, so this cash account, if I were to go to my core accounts and then the cash account tab, the fields that are on the, um, the fields that I have on that page would correspond roughly to my properties. Now, if I open this dropdown, um, I can see that there are other uh, pages in here, like my disbursements, but I have a whole lot more. So it's not one-to-one -one with the different pages you might use. Sometimes, um, sometimes some of the pages have a couple different options. So as you're making reports, you might have to try, you know, a couple different ones. But uh, just kind of a quick tip that I've found is to look and say, you know, if I'm on the cash account, there's something I want from the cash account page that can be helpful. 
as you look at this list on the side then, um, if I want something that can come right from that cash account page, usually I can find it. It doesn't have an arrow next to it. It would just be one of these primary fields that I could double click or click and drag over to my grid. And then I have um, these items with the arrows as well. Sometimes those are maybe different sections on the page. So this code, if I use the drop down there, that could be um, you know, more detail about the cash account code. And some of these actually link to different like quote unquote pages. So different categories that you can kind of drill down and add additional information that might not be directly from that main object, but you want to use on your report. So if I open the drop down for budgets, anything pertaining, uh, anything under this drop down is going to pertain to budget. So I have a full account code on here. That's going to be the full budget code. So just kind of handy to keep in mind as you're creating those reports. Um, if you drill down, I mean, you can drill down several levels sometimes. For the most part, you're good. Um, when you drill down, it'll put the information on the report. The um, one thing that I've found is if you're making an Excel data report, be cautious with using those because if you drill down like several, several levels, that's when you're going to end up seeing those columns with brackets on it because it's trying to pull over um, information to relate to your primary object. Okay, so once we get all the properties that we want on here, um, the next thing that I would probably consider, so first let's look at our main report actually. So I have that generated down here. This is just your standard cash summary report. Now it doesn't have any control breaks or anything, so what I'm getting is all of those properties that I see in my grid, each, just each in their own column. Very straightforward. If we start thinking about some of our more complex reports that have different headers, or maybe you're trying to build a report that has different headers, different categories, subtotals on it, that's all going to tie back uh, for the most part to the control breaks. So for this one, um, I have each, um, each cash account, but maybe I want to see this by the fund. So I want all of my 001s together with the subtotal, all of my 002s, and so on. So if I wanted to get those subtotals, what I need to do is use this control break. Um, this account code is my uh, fund special cost center. So I'm going to go grab the, actually just the fund. And in order to make it a header, the first thing I'm going to do is choose a sort priority. And I want it to be the first priority. So I'll change this other one to two. I'm going to choose to make it a control break. And then whenever I make them a control break, uh, or yeah, whenever I make them a control break, I probably don't also want a column for that information, so I usually suppress it. So sort priority, control break, and then use the extended properties to suppress. I'm going to be running this report a couple different times because I like to take a look at. Um, you know, what each change does. Usually when I'm building a report or modifying them, that's, I end up with like 10 of them open. So we'll probably be looking at this one a couple times. Okay. So now that I've added that control break, I can see it moved that fund up here to the header. And then each time there's a new fund, I also get the subtotals. The other thing that this is going to affect, once I make it a control break, that is actually going to um, also allow that information and those subtotals to show on the summary report. So if you're trying to um, build those summary versions and you're trying to get something to show on there, those control breaks become very important.
the next thing I notice once I do this is now I can see my descriptions for each fund group are the same. So if I was cleaning up this report, I'd probably say, you know, that's kind of repetitive. I don't really need that on each line. So I can take this description and move it up here with my header. And if I flip back here, so I'm going to go back to our properties. So here's our description field. And if I use the extended properties, I can make it a control header only. When I'm using the control header only, I don't have to also suppress it because um, that one's got the only, so for that one it knows. And in order to tell it which header I want it to link up with, I have to make that the same sort priority as my control break. Because you can end up having multiple control breaks and then multiple control headers that link up with them. So maybe I have my first group and then my second group. So whichever one I want it to match up with, I just have to match these, um, the sort of priority on those. And we'll generate that again here. So now it took that description and moved it up to our header. Now we have plenty of room for all of our columns, so if these numbers get big, we're not going to see, um, you know, wrapping, and um, it's kind of just a little bit cleaner. And, I mean, it definitely depends on what kind of report you're building. Um, this one's account-based. You might have transaction-based, so sometimes you may want to um, categorize those in different ways. You can use multiple control breaks, and um, I'm not going to uh, go through the process again, but just to show you an example here. I have a budget summary, so this one has control break with the first sort priority as the fund special cost center, and then the control break with the second sort priority as the object. So you could add several control breaks um, that go down in sort priority and that would sort of group your information. Each time you do that, you're going to get a subtotal line. So if you have a lot of them, sometimes the end will have um, quite a few stacked. And then the other thing that's going to happen is within, so like on this report, if I ran it for multiple funds, within each fund, I'm going to start at the first object and go from object, you know, 100, whatever, to, it, um, to the last object in that group. When I get to the next fund, I'm starting over on object codes. Okay. And then, let's see, so, Back on the properties, um, those are kind of the big hitters. Most of the reports that I've built, it's really kind of figuring out what I want as a control break, um, how to move those around. Um, once you get that set, you do have the functions over here. So all of these are set to sum or to um, calculate a total of each of those columns at the bottom. Uh, you do have some options if you wanted to create an average or if you wanted to show the minimum or maximum in that uh, column. And then the extended properties over here, I'm just going to open these up real quick again. The other one that I find myself using a bit is this column title. So usually um, for the column headers, so let me up over here. For the column headers up here, I usually leave those alone, but sometimes when you start adding your, um, your control breaks, you might want to change what this says right here. And so if you ever want to change that, you just come into your extended properties, change this column title, and then it'll update um, what that title is on the header. 
I also use the width sometimes. Uh, some of these reports, if you're adding a lot of numerical columns, um, maybe a description in there. Sometimes uh, the figures can wrap. So if you ever want to widen a column to make sure that it has enough um, for you know the full dollar amount on one line, uh, usually 16, I think, is what I end up using for the width. So sometimes you might have to try that one a couple times. If you're widening one column, it's got to come from somewhere. So you know you may not be able to widen all the columns on your report, but that one is handy. And then you know I'm going to generate this one more time. So I mentioned uh, the summary report. Once we put those control headers on there, that's going to show on the summary version. So let's just look at that real quick. The summary report option can be saved within the report when you're building it. So anything up in these report options here, um, if you're building something that maybe would always run as a CSV or Excel, you can change that. If I check this summary report and then save you know, give this a new name and save my report, it will save that option as standard. So when somebody else opens it and runs it, it would automatically default to this. So now here's the summary version of what I created. I don't see my individual fund special cost centers, but everything that was a subtotal I'm getting on that report. I've seen that used a bit for um, grants. Districts would like uh, just a summary of the, you know, the different grant accounts. Um, so they might use just kind of that quick version. The next section I'm going to talk about here is the filters. So once I get to this middle tab for the filters, so the the first tab is going to control what I see as far as columns or headers. And then the second tab for the filters is going to narrow down what information is contained in those columns and headers, or it will allow you to. Um, you have a couple different options here. You can um, add these filters with uh, the parameters so that when you generate the report, users would have an option to type in that data or you could uh, hard code it into the report. I'm not sure that that's the official term, but that's what I call it, <laughs> where uh, you would actually you know, type in your value in here um, when, you add, when you add the filter. So um, what the one that I want to add here as an example is this all amount zero filter. So if I go, I'm going to hop back over to my report here real quick. So if I look at this report that I just created, I see a lot of lines where everything is just all zeros, and this is an eight-page report right now. So if this is something that a treasurer wants, you know, maybe they give this to their board members on a regular basis, they're printing out eight pages for every board member, and it has a lot of information that they may not need. So they probably, uh, they possibly want to filter that out. So if I go to my um, parameters, or if I go to my filters, add all amount zero, and then this one you use equals. If I say, um, so it's, do I want to show the line if all of the amounts equal zero? If I said true, it would give me a full report of everything that has just zero. If I say false, then it will take all of those lines that are just zero off of my report. Now that filter is available on different kinds of reports. So, you know, this one we're looking at a cash summary. You could add it to a budget summary, appropriation summary, and it'll um, consider which object you're using and look at the different fields related to that object to see if it should um, rule out those, um, those different lines. So now that we've added that filter to our report, we only have two pages, and every single, um, 
every single line has at least some activity or some value in one of these columns. Um, if you wanted to make this something that would show on the page when you go to generate the report, we could write it in here. And a lot of times when I'm doing this, I kind of just look at one of these um, other one, one of these other options that's already written. This is kind of the minimum required is just to give it a unique name. Um, there are a couple different resources as far as understanding and building these parameters. And um, here, I'll show you what this looks like and then we'll take a look at um, some of the documentation. So if I just put in the bare minimum here, now I have all amount zero. I could run true or false uh, when I actually generate the report or if I leave it blank, I would get both like I was originally getting. So on the wiki, if you're um, if you want to use those parameters, if that's something that's kind of um, something that you're getting used to, the custom report creator page under the configure filters section does have examples of each operation that you could use for the filters, and then it actually has a screenshot here of what a parameter would look like um, to use to enter in and then what that would look like when you run the report. So this is really helpful um, if you are trying those out. Sometimes I will copy and paste it from another report that I know it's on and then paste it in <laughs> if, it's, if you know it's the same parameter. We might want to be careful doing that. <laughs> Um, the other place that you can find information on those parameters, so if you are on the, I'm just back to our main wiki page, there's a fiscal software knowledge base. And this is more like article style information, so under these how-to articles, there is an article on user parameters in template reports. And this kind of breaks down a little bit more like what each piece of those parameters are doing. So if you want to understand um, like what's required, what's not, I would recommend coming in here and reading this step-by-step -step guide. Get back here. Okay, let's see. Um, one of the other filters that we have on here, and this one is written into this report, is the total as of period. So this one, when we look at it in our filters, it's the as of period filter. So these have been um, sort of in progress. So this title actually was just modified in the most recent release. Um, when you're using, uh, or when you're looking at generating reports for different time periods or date ranges, there are a couple different styles of reports, and um, depending on the different style, you may be using this as of period, or you may be using a date range. Um, the main thing that I think about is if the report is account based. So this is a cash summary report pulled from account information. Um, or if it's transaction-based, something like a purchase order detail where I have all those purchase order transactions and I'm getting a full listing out of all of those transactions with the total at the bottom of what I've chosen to see. So um, on this one, as an account-based report, it has totals that are fiscal to date, that are month to date, something that would be the total sum of a specific period that is defined within the system. So if I have that, um, anytime I see this, I can enter in um, a date of the period that I want to see. So um, for this one, like right now, I'm in fiscal year 20, but if I wanted to see this as of the end of fiscal year 19, that would be June of 2019, I could enter in any date in June. 
and even if I enter 6-1, it would still give me the end of the month I'm entering. So if you feel better entering 6-30, you could do that instead. And then when I generate this, now the totals that I see at the end of the report, um, the fiscal to date totals are gonna be fiscal year 19, and the month to date totals are gonna be June of 2019. Oh, I took my took my all zeros filter off of there, so we got a long one again. So month to date received for June, fiscal to date received, so all of these figures are gonna correspond. So if districts are trying to get um, a report for that prior year, that is um, a quick and easy way to do that. Now, if I'm looking at a transaction-based report instead, something that actually has a listing of specific um, transactions in the system, like purchase orders or like disbursements, those are the reports where I would actually see a start and stop date, um, like a transaction start date, transaction stop date, and then I would use a range like that instead. Okay, so I think that Amanda, is about it. Yes. Amanda, um, short of having a um, uh, um, report header on there, and I think Pat just asked the same question, um, is there anything on that report that would identify what period that, port was, that report was for? Um, I don't believe so. Um, well, the one thing you could do outside of the header is if you did the show report options. Let's see what that looks like. Because if you show your report options, then you get that cover page. So, so that might be a reason actually that if you want to use the June 30th date. Because I mean, you're going to get the, your. I'm yeah. sorry. The other option that I've used is to put it in my uh, report title. So I actually changed the report title so that it does show that. When you go back to generate. Yep. Yeah, so you could definitely put it in the report name as well. And while we're here, I did want to mention something. Uh, even when you're all, with your all zeros, all zero amount, one of the things that I found is that if you have the pre encumbrance module turned on and you are using that all zeros um, and you have a pre-encumbrance or an encumbrance out there that's not been, uh, purchase order's not been generated on, you may see all zeros across your report, but that's because you have an encumbrance out there. So it doesn't, it doesn't happen or it doesn't occur if you don't have that pre-encumbrance module turned on. But if you have that pre-encumbrance module turned on and you expect to see a report with no all zeros and you have all zeros, then you probably have an encumbrance out there Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Dee. Sorry, I missed that chat. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I think your title or those report options um, for that. Um, I think, yeah, about wrapped up on this part, does anybody else have questions about um, the properties, the filters, anything that we talked about here um, for this section? Okay, so um, for this part, I would just wrap this up. I'd give it, you know, my name uh, for whatever I wanted to call the report and then save it. Honestly, I usually save the report like six times as I'm creating it and tweaking things. So, um, but just don't remember to save it once you're, or don't, don't forget to save it once you're done. And then, um, let's see. Oh, so the other thing, um, I wanted to kind of touch on here while we're looking at these pages is I mentioned that, you know, this looks similar 
to the custom report creator. Um, once you're in here, you know, you'd come in, you'd select your object, and then start building if you wanted to build a brand new report right from here. Um, kind of a fun tip that I've uh, been using that I've found, uh, and of course I selected an object that's going to take a minute here, is if you are getting into writing reports or like as you're training your districts up and they're starting to want to build reports, it can be really intimidating when you think you want a custom report, you don't know which template you want, um, and then you start from scratch and just have this blank page. So one of the tips that I've been using is to actually go into the grid and use the Save As option. And I'm going to show that here, but I'm a little worried to change the page. Let's see. Just give it a minute here. Okay, so I just switched over to the activity ledger. And um, as I'm going through, say, like, I know that the information that I want on my report I could find on this activity ledger. So if I come in here and then um, let's do, I'm going to filter down a date. I only want anything that's happened since the start of this fiscal year. I know I want invoices. And I only want anything that's over $1,000. So now I have my grid. I could um, click this report up here. I can get a report right from my grid. A lot of times that's kind of nice to use as uh, districts are actually going through the process, like if they're converting recs and then they want to get a quick report or um, if they're on that payables grid and want to get a quick report. But um, this takes a minute to open here. But what we're going to actually do is we can run it from here, but we can also save ourselves a template, and then that way we have something to work with uh, when we go into the report manager. All right, so now I have my pop-up. I could give my report a title here. And I could just generate it. But if I use this Save As option on the bottom, so let's save this. Gives me a pop-up. That sends it to my report manager. Let's generate and look at what we're starting with here. This is what our grid report would look like. So I have all of my columns. These are straightforward, just the basic information that I have in my grid. Really simple. If I hop over to my report manager now, I have this invoices fiscal year 20. Now it's a report definition, and I can go in here and modify it. So, you know, I, I knew that I wanted an invoice report. If I run it, oops, if I run it um, directly from the grid, you know, it may not be um, like may not have the headers I want. It's not as organized. It doesn't look as nice. Um, but then if I come to my report manager, it's not like I have to start from scratch to try and figure out how to build that same report. Let this load here, and then we'll look at, we'll add um, like a control header and get rid of some of those extra columns that um, I don't think we need it on there. All 
Okay. So, yeah, if I'm just looking at invoices, I think I can take out some of these things that I left on my grid. So, like, enabled, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of some of these extra items. Type, uh, we know that it's going to be an invoice, so we don't really need to see that. And then I have, you know, all the information from my grids. The cool thing I just want to look at real quick is the filters. So whatever I typed in to filter down my grid on, it now automatically created these filters for me. It recognized that the date and the amount should be greater than or equal to. It added in the type. So I don't have to show that as a column on my report anymore because the filter automatically um, generated in there. And then I could come in here and say, maybe I want to make my invoice my control break. So sort priority. Let's change this. So one, two, and then suppress that. Oh, you know the other thing I noticed? Sorry not to hop back and forth too much here. But I noticed this PO item had a sum on it. So let's take that off because we don't need a sum of the item numbers. We just want the amount as the only total on our uh, report. So now I have um, a subtotal of everything, all of the items within a specific invoice number. Um, I have this where I can easily see each individual invoice and have my total on there. So quite a bit better than just like my straight grid report and not, you know, and I didn't have to start from scratch, not too much to just modify that a little bit further. Okay. So next we're going to move into uh, the report link example. So let me get back to my home page here and close out some of these extra. I told you, I run this thing so many times, I end up with 10 of them every time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up our documentation page as well. So if we go to, I'm on the USAS documentation, appendix, report procedures, and um, pull up this page for the create financial detail spreadsheet with a running fund balance. Now we're going to use this as our example of how to use the report link. This page has a template a spreadsheet that you can use and just to kind of walk you through that process, um, it has uh, the different um, items that you would need to um, have your beginning balance and have it calculate. Now, once you get used to this process, you can certainly use the report link and pull it into a blank spreadsheet. You can use it in different um, ways. If you want to write the formula for your own fund balance, you can certainly do that. So this is just kind of a starting point. The first thing we would want to do is click to download this template if you're going to use this process. The template report is written for about 50,000 entries. Um, so it has the formulas kind of copied down. So if you have more than that, you might need to extend out the formula for the fund balance. Uh, if you have less than that, you might want to delete the extra lines if you're going to print it or something. Um, but in general, it's a good starting spot um, for um, most districts. I mean, towards the end of the fiscal year, I don't know. They could get a lot of a lot of transactions, but just be cautious of that. Um, also, when you open it, so let me, I already downloaded this, so I just want to open it. Um, when you open it, for the first time, you might have a bar up here where you have to enable editing. Um, so just make sure you click that so that you have access to be able to um, add your data when you're ready. So this is what the template looks like just to start with. Um, it's kind of just a basic shell uh, that you can use. And let me get back here. Sorry, I'm just going to put 
have an extra copy that I have on my other screen. So if you want to print this out um, to walk through the process, you can always use these three little dots up here. I usually export it to be to PDF, and then that's kind of nice. Um, or just bookmark it, you know, whatever works. Um, the next thing we're going to do to actually get our data to put in the spreadsheet is we're going to go back to USSR and generate our financial detail report um, or click to generate uh, with the July 1 cash balances. And the reason I like to use this one with the July 1 cash balances is because this is always going to create for my current fiscal year. So if the district creates this, like now, or if they create it in July for their current fiscal year, um, then it's going to pull in that information starting July 1. As they go throughout the year, once they build this spreadsheet, they would have the ability to refresh it. So it's always going to be whatever it is from July 1 of their current period. So once you come in here, um, the first thing you want to do is change your format to XML table. You can enter in if you want this to have specific funds or specific parameters. Um, I have it narrowed down to just the general fund uh, with the 000 special cost center because uh, I don't want it to pull too much so it doesn't take too long. And once we have the parameters that we want, we'll come up and create a save and recall. As soon as I hit tab, I have the option to save. And then once I save, I have this report link icon that pops up. So I'm going to click that to show the report link. And so this link can be used to uh, bookmark, share the report, a um, couple different things you can do here. If we're using it with Excel, um, we do not want to click this include parameters button. Um, that it adds the specific um, parameters that you've entered, so like the specific funds, it'll add it to the report link, um, which can make it really long and sometimes Excel can't handle that, so I would not include the parameters. But you do want to make sure that whatever user is creating this report link, since you're not including the parameters, they, can, they should not go change that save and recall unless they want it to change the report that they're using it in Excel with. So if there's any change to my financial detail save and recall, then it would change. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and copy this link address. And once I do that, I can go back to my Excel template. Going to the Data tab and using the From Web option. And once I come in here in this address, sometimes I get this. It seems to be fine to close it out. <laughs> and um, once you paste your link in here, you want to click Go. It's going to pop up and ask you for your username and password. So this is going to be the, um, the USAS uh, username and password. Oh, let me make sure I type that right. So once that loads, our little window, this is what our pop-up is going to look like. This is our HTML table uh, format that we selected. And um, when you see your data in this window, you also have the opportunity now to click this import. 
and the steps along the way here, this does usually take a minute, so I think I put some notes in the um, walkthrough so that you can kind of know when to expect that it may take a minute so that it doesn't, um, you know, I know sometimes when you're going to load these things and, and you're waiting, you're like, did I click the right thing? <laughs> so this is normal. All right, so once it uh, makes that link, now it's going to ask me where should I put my data in this spreadsheet. And I have the little cell highlighted here, so I'm going to choose A3 as basically where I want my um, table to start for what I'm pulling in. And then I can see down in this corner here, it says running background query. So that's kind of the same thing you'd get with Safari, honestly, where you could see that it was um, going out there to collect the information. And once that loads, it's going to go ahead. It'll pull all of my information from the financial detail report right into my spreadsheet. And so first I have my encumbrances, but as I scroll down here, I see some received, some expended. So in order to use this template, the last thing that I have to do is grab this beginning fund balance and just enter that in manually um, into this box. So it kind of depends on the parameters that you're using. In this case, I just did it for one fund. So I could go look at the beginning balance for that fund in my software. Um, I, could, I could even see it if I generated this report, which let's do that. Um, or you could run, if you're running multiple funds, you could run like a cash summary and get the beginning balance uh, total. But um, probably if you're looking at your fund balance, you're probably looking at a single fund. So depends on what you're using there. Oh, meant to run that as a, as a PDF. Sorry about that. Okay, so this has the fund balance right in my header here. And when I come back over to my template, if I just put that in um, my box E2, then it's going to carry that over here. Here's my starting fund balance. These are all encumbrances. But as I come down, when I have these transactions, it'll actually keep the running balance here. And, and on down the line. So, um, and then this box, so this will go find the ending fund balance from the bottom of the spreadsheet. And your total received amount is going to add up everything in this column, total expended, everything in this column. Now what I can do is I can save this spreadsheet, file, save as, you know, give it whatever name I want and save it to my computer. Now I have my financial detail. It's always going to pull from July 1st, but as I move on in time, I'm going to have more transactions that stack up in my system. When I come back in here a month later and I want to see my financial detail and where everything's at, what I can do is Again, go to the, the data tab. I can click refresh all, um, or honestly, if you click anywhere in here and then click refresh, what it's going to do is pop up and um, ask you to log in again. So um, it'll just ask for that USAS username and password, and then it'll run the query in the background, and it'll update, and it'll bring in any new transactions on the bottom of this spreadsheet. So you can use this throughout the year and you don't have to make that report link every time. Once you um, create the spreadsheet and save it, then it's good to go. 
the link can, since the link can be shared with other users, um, the other thing is, you know, say they have this saved in like a shared drive or uh, they send the spreadsheet to somebody, if a user, maybe not the person who created the report link, um, if they were to open this spreadsheet and then click refresh, it asks them for their username and password. It doesn't have to be the same username and password as whoever created it. It could be someone else's as long as they have access to USAF. So that report link is pretty handy. Um, I mean, again, this is one example, but you could definitely do this with um, different reports. You know, say you wanted like a disbursement summary, you wanted a listing of all of your checks, wanted that to go in Excel. Um, you could do the same thing. You know, you just create your uh, report parameters, do the save and recall, and then, you know, when you go to put in a report link, like say you're just pasting it right into a blank sheet, um, some treasures create spending plans or um, different spreadsheets that they keep track for their five-year forecast. So anything that they might have um, like used a Safari and used that refresh option in, you could uh, use this for, um, you just either use one of the existing reports or even if you needed to write a custom report to pull that information in. So all of these reports have this report link option. Any questions about the report link? Amanda, this is Dave. <clears throat> Did you actually do the refresh all? <clears throat> I did not click it just now, no. Be and I don't know, because I've not used the template report, but mm -hmm. I know that when I, when I created my own report and I clicked refresh all, it brought in all the new information, but it got rid of my uh, running fund balance <clears throat> because that wasn't what was being brought in. And I found that I had to, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have my information in front of me, but I had to click on a particular area and I had to just refresh, um, just there was an, an option for a drop down to just refresh. But when I mm. clicked refresh all, it actually got rid of my fund balances. But I, like I said, I didn't use I've not used the template, so I don't know if it's set up differently than okay. the sheet that I had. I did try it before. Um, I mean, I just tried it now, but I was already logged in, so I don't know maybe if you like save and come back in, but I've tried it before and I didn't notice anything um, off with it, but that would be a good thing to look out for. Um, you know, when you, so maybe just instead of refresh all, because you don't really have to refresh all, in this one you just have one query that you're using. So um, you could just do the click and refresh, or even when you do this drop down, you can just do refresh. So um, that sounds like a good tip. Okay. Um, so the last thing I just want to touch on is a little bit about the job scheduler and um, really using those cron expressions. So, um, you know, the report link, that gives a nice way to share information, to share reports, but that does require a login. So the job scheduler is your option for sharing of reports within the district um, that doesn't require a login. So you don't want to do that with any secure reports. Um, but it can be a nice way to be able to have, um, a, you know, say you're going to email a budget summary to a principal and you want that to happen on a regular basis. Or sometimes with like student activity reports, they want to send those out regularly. So um, to use that job scheduler option, you would come in, uh, click to generate a report, and it's going to be accessible to schedule reports using this little uh, clock icon at the bottom here. Now, if I click that, this page looks really basic. So the first time I saw it, I'm like, okay, so I got three fields. <laughs> what do I do? Um, under that appendix, there is a page for scheduling reports with the cron jobs. Uh, that is really helpful, so take a look out there. Um, the basics, though, the job name, this is going to be what it schedules this job as, so you're going to want to make sure that that's unique. 
if I'm scheduling multiple budget summary reports, I can't have them all be named budget summary report. So this one, you know, I would say um, budget summary student activities or something. The Cron expression, uh, we'll come back to that in a minute here, but that is going to determine the interval as and like the um, time frame when that's going to be sent. And then send output to is where it's going to send that report. And so this can be an email address. So maybe this person is not listed, they don't log into USAS ever, but you want them to get a report um, on, you want to schedule a report to send it, you can put in, just put in their email address and then it's going to send, and then that's where it would send this report. Um, so for the cron expression, We have a, there's a website where you can, um, that you can use to generate these expressions. I'm just gonna paste it in the chat. It's also on that wiki page. So if anybody wants to um, open that and look at it, this is really handy. Um, it's just like a cron expression generator. Oops, got my little bullet point in there. Oh, here it is. So if you're getting started with these, probably the easiest place to start when you get to this page, if you scroll down, they have examples of um, all of the intervals that you could use. So if you wanted this to send, you know, every, every day at 1 a.m., I could just copy this, oops, just copy this expression right here, paste it right into my job scheduler, click save, I'm good to go. If you want to uh, get a little bit more custom with these, it does have a generator up here. Um, what the cron expression is, is it has these seven different pieces. So as we see, you know, we have zero, zero, you know. Um, each of these different pieces corresponds to a different measurement of time. So the first, whatever the first one is, uh, is for seconds, minutes, and so on. So this is nice because it lists this out here to show you, you know, what that means. And so it'll always be seven characters with a space in between. Space is important too. If you were to come in here and say, you know, say the district knows they want this sent every Monday or every 15th day of the month or that sort of thing, um, you know, you could come in here and use these options to make specific selections. And then it's going to build your cron expression down here. And you could copy it from there. The other thing that I like on this page is that if there's something you're trying to build and you're not really sure if you did it right, you can paste an expression that you already have in this, um, in this box up here and you have the option to describe it. So it says, okay, this is when it's going to send. Or you can even see the next dates that it's going to happen. So I can see, all right. It's going to go through, it's going to be the 14th of every month, and that's when it's actually going to schedule it to send. Once I'm good with that, all I do is come over here, paste that in, and then save. And it schedules it, good to go. If I want to check on scheduled jobs that I have out there, um, I can go to the utilities and then look at my job scheduler. And I can see on here, so there's my budget essay that was scheduled by me and it's pending. And then here's the next time it's going to send. If I click on that line, I can open it up. Um, the status is kind of helpful, so um, you can see if it's completed. Once these are sending for a while, it'll show you the last time it was run, the next time it's going to be run. 
And if you need to cancel it, you can use the X right here to stop it, um, and then it will not send anymore. Any users that have admin access, so right now, yeah, I'm an admin with, with my login. I can see every single job that's scheduled. Um, if I had a district user go in and they schedule something, I could see it. But if you're not an admin, you can only see the jobs that you schedule. So it is a value if you're working with a district and they want to schedule a lot of reports. You may want to work with your district to help them schedule um, through their own login because once they schedule those, if they want to stop it, they would be able to go in and see what they have out there and then stop it if they wanted to, um, maybe stop one and start a different report or something like that. Okay, well, that is all I have on that. Do we have any questions there? Okay, well, we hit 10 o'clock. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording. Uh, we'll hang out for another minute if anybody has um, any additional questions. But thank you, everyone, for signing in today, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you.